All right, so Brexit. Okay, so let's, let's start to talk about that. Um, none of this, I'm not gonna be using any economic models or theory, but there will be data involved. And I'm not trying to make a positive case here. So I'll just be describing lots of stuff, but I'm gonna have a very normative um, viewpoint here. And I'm not gonna try to disguise it. I think Brexit was a disaster and is an ongoing disaster, primarily for the UK. But for anyone who cares about Europe, and in a larger sense for the world as a whole, I, I, I think it's unambiguously and unequivocally a terrible thing, especially for the Brits, but not just for the Brits. Okay, so um, this is the most serious, certainly European, political and economic development of the last year or two. Okay, and really, in a lot of senses, this was an unthinkable event. Okay, um, I'm going to focus just primarily on the political and economic aspects, but there are other aspects. I freely acknowledge it. Um, I'm, I, I keep up to date and I'm, I'm pretty well acquainted with the economic and, and to a lesser extent political consequences, but I don't want to deny that there, there have been lots of other things as well, but that's going to be the focus here, political and economic. Okay. The most important first thing to remember about Brexit was it was, to a very good first approximation, unexpected, which is sort of an interesting thing, okay? Because I was following it very closely for years ahead of time, okay, the basic idea, and then as soon as they announced that there was going to be a, a formal referendum, I followed it for months very closely. The polls, the opinion polls, were extremely close throughout the campaign, okay? However, and so you might say, if the, the opinion polls were close, why was it unexpected? So this was not like Trump winning, because the opinion polls were not particularly close on that. So most people were surprised by Trump. Brexit was different because the betting markets, all the financial markets said it's not going to happen. Okay? So the polls looked like this. Okay? So the red scatters are for leave. Okay, the green on top were remain, and there's sort of a moving average with a confidence interval um, in there. And you see towards the end, they were very close, but they were never very far apart. Okay, however, most people discounted that because their view was the typical Brit might say, I'm gonna vote for exit, but when I actually came, um, push came to shove when they entered the, the, the polling booth, they would actually vote to remain because at that point, the pocketbook issues come in and they vote, they vote their wallet and they, they do what's sensible, okay? So that they would complain in the polls. So most people discounted the polls, okay? People like me didn't care so much about the polls. We cared about what people who actually put their money on it um, cared about. And these were the betting odds. This is a, 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 <clears throat> a consensus across the different betting agencies, as most of you know, in the UK as in many places, but not so much in the United States. Everything is bet upon. Okay, so you have a time series moving average of the chances of Brexit, and red is the chance of remain. And even late on the day of June the 23rd, the day of the referendum, late that day, okay, remain was at 76%. Okay, so most people thought it's, they're going to remain. Incidentally, um, feel free to take pictures of the slides if you like, but they're freely available on, on, on my website. Okay, all of this stuff is, is available. For, for anyone who's actually ever done anything on my research, which means insulting my research to a first approximation, um, <laughs> it's all freely available on my, including data and F. I get into trouble on that. Um, okay, so even late on the day of, of the actual referendum, okay, it, it was viewed as likely that um, Brexit would go down. Okay, in fact, that, uh, after the, the polls started to came, um, come in, um, the leader of the UKIP party, um, Farage, said that it looks like they're going to remain. They'll just pull it off. But, okay, that's important because, because it was a surprise, the consequences of Brexit were never really considered carefully, and we're living with the consequences of that. Okay, so the actual um, referendum wording is, is up on the screen. Should the United Kingdom remain a member of the European Union or leave the European Union? Okay, so if you remain, that's well defined. If you leave, what are you leaving for? The alternative was not well specified, okay? And certainly the Brexit campaigners didn't say what they were going to do because it wasn't ever clear. 
So the consequences of a, a vote in favor of Brexit were never really clear. It wasn't like you're voting for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump and, well, actually, that's not a well-defined alternative either. So uh, um, it's like the generic Democrat versus the generic Republican. You sort of understand what, what, what you're, you're voting for. But this is, if you vote to leave, what are you voting to leave for? Okay, it was, it's never well-defined. Well and that uncertainty is a big deal. Okay. Um, okay, I have to provide some political background. I'll try and be relatively brief, but I, I, it's important to understand the Conservative Party, um, which leads the UK now, um, and will almost surely lead it for another five years, because uh, an election was just announced a, a, a few weeks ago, and the Conservatives, led by Theresa May, will almost surely win in a big way, okay? And so understanding the Conservative Party is, un is key to understanding what's going to happen. Okay, so there's been lots of skepticism inside the Conservative Party about the European Union dating back for decades. Okay, so Margaret Thatcher, arguably the most important uh, British politician of the last 30 or 40 years, okay, um, <clears throat> she is in, in some sense the most obvious example of that ambivalence or, or dislike of, of uh, the European Union, but it's actually earlier um, because the, you may not know this, but the Brits tried to enter the European, it was known at that point as the European Economic Community twice in the 60s, and they were turned down. So that's another manifestation of the, the, the fact that the French have always hated the Brits and vice versa because the, the French vetoed Brit, uh, British entry. Um, um, entry by the UK into the European Economic Community was in the early 70s, okay? And it was actually negotiated by a conservative prime minister, Heath, Okay, but there was then a referendum held by a Labour Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, a couple of years later, which they won in one handily. Okay, so there, this, is, this was the second referendum on the European, um, uh, the U European integration. Um, so the, the uh, <clears throat> Conservative Party has always been ambivalent, and most Brits will admit to being ambivalent about, in their feelings about Europe. Okay, so just a, a few things. Um, the Brits viewed themselves as being exploited by um, the, European, um, the Europeans for fiscal reasons, and Thatcher famously won um, her rebates so that the Brits get a special rebate um, from the Europeans, um, and that's, that was in 1985. Margaret Thatcher, who'd won three big elections for the Conservative Party, fell over two issues. So she was deposed in 1990, okay, and there were two big issues. The biggest issue was the poll tax, which was very unpopular. However, she wanted less and less um, contact with Europe, and in particular, she did not want the Brits to start along the path towards European Monetary Union, and they didn't, she wanted to keep the pound completely separate from the exchange rate stabilization mechanism. She lost over that, she was deposed, John Major took over, um, and that led then to the, the crisis, the exchange rate mechanism crisis, when the, the British pound was thrown out of the exchange rate mechanism in 1992. So that's another sore spot. The Conservatives lost the reputation for fiscal probity at that point, and Tony Blair then won three straight governments. So the Conservatives have always been split about this. It's, it's, it's a long time ago. Okay, so what's happened more recently, um, the UK Independence Party, UKIP, um, started to rise in popularity about five years ago, and that led to shivers down the, the spine of the Prime Minister, David Cameron. Okay, so in 2013, so as to defuse the UKIP um, f um, threat, um, a referendum was promised by him if he won election, okay. And most people, including him, to the best of my knowledge, did not expect the Conservative government to win re-election. They were re-elected um, two years ago, and that was a surprise. So they were not counting on holding a referendum. Okay, it sort of came as a surprise. Okay, um, so what happened more recently? Okay, well, about a year and a half ago, the UK uh, renegotiated the conditions of their membership. Okay, now most people realized this was pure window dressing, okay, and really nothing of substance was going to happen, and nothing of substance did happen, okay. So there are some face saving protocols so that um, David Cameron could take his package back to the British people and sell it to the British people as like, we've just won all these extra freedoms, but most people realized it, that there was nothing of substance. So there was a recognition that the, U, that the um, European Union has different currencies. Well, 
that was sort of obvious beforehand. You don't really have to write it down as a protocol. Um, there was something that was more important, which is that the Eurozone couldn't damage um, any, any substantial interests of the European Union, um, essentially associated with the European Monetary Union. And really, the focus was on protecting the city of London and the UK's financial services, which are a huge deal, as I'm sure you all know. Okay, they're very important to the British economy. Okay, so after he won that package, or could say that he won that package, um, David Cameron then set June 23rd as the referendum date. Okay, but just to make sure that you're all aware, there are these, there's this long-standing history of antagonism between the UK and the European Union, especially in the Conservative Party, which was the government, okay? And part of that was the result of two manifestations. Um, first one was, is something that is still going on, and I still expect to resurface more in the future, which is the Euro crisis, okay? So the Greeks ran into a big crisis almost exactly seven years ago. In fact, it would have been seven years ago this weekend that everyone was, was negotiating in Athens. And Grexit is still a, a very serious fear. There have been three IMF packages. Most people expect there to be a fourth one and so forth. And austerity in, in Europe is very unpopular Okay, and the Brits are doing pretty well economically, and they're looking at Europe and seeing what a disaster it is, especially in the South, okay, Southern Europe. Okay, so that's the first one. The new wrinkle, okay, over the last couple of years has been the migration crisis. Okay, so lots of people entering the European Union illicitly often from Northern Africa, but also from Turkey, okay? And some of these are Syrians and Libyans, but some of them are coming from further afield, okay? So some of them are coming from Afghanistan and Pakistan, and some of them are coming from Western Africa, and that's a serious ongoing crisis. And the Brits look at this and say, we want no part of it. Okay, so that's an ongoing issue, and we'll talk about that. Um, and then the, the, um, the government, Cameron's government at the time, uh, was surprised that some very high-profile um, high um, members of parliament decided to, um, to vote to leave. Okay. So Michael Gove, the Home Secretary, so that's the equivalent of sort of the, the Attorney General um, of the United States. That's the person in charge of the judicial system. So very important person. Boris Johnson, who's his own character, and I'm sure you've all seen his hair and so forth, but a very high-profile guy, um, the mayor, uh, former mayor of London, and now he's the foreign secretary, but a sort of wild man in his own way. Um, and it wasn't really clear which way he would go, right? Because he's sort of like Donald Trump in the sense that he has very strongly held convictions that can change in the, the blink of an eye, right? So, um, and you just don't know how he's gonna come down. Um, and of you. Okay. Um, okay. So, what have been the, the political consequences so far of, of, of what we've seen? And incidentally, I wrote these notes less than a month ago, and they're, they're already slightly out of date. Um, so, um, David Cameron, um, after losing the Brexit referendum, okay, it's not, not an issue, um, stepped down. Okay. He did not do what he said he would do, which was um, to start the exit process immediately. He immediately stepped down. He's been replaced by Theresa May, um, who has just recently called an election, which she, she will win, unless I'm very surprised, in a huge fashion. Okay. Um, the Labour Party, the main opposition, is in terrible shape, okay, because for, primarily because they have a terrible leader in Jeremy Corbyn. But part of the way that you know that he was terrible is because he campaigned to remain, but in a really ineffectual, half-hearted way. Okay, and that's a problem for um, the, uh, the Labour Party, okay? But it also means that right now, okay, the British um, Parliament has no effective opposition, okay? And having an effective opposition is really always a good idea for any democracy because you always want the government to be challenged, to have to defend its positions against a serious, credible opposition. So that, that's a serious problem. Okay, what else? Okay, so as probably uh, most of you know, um, the Scots are, they're not as perennially difficult as the Irish, but they've been very difficult for a long time. Um, there was a referendum to, for the Scots to leave um, the UK, okay? And um, the Scots are much more pro-EU for 
reasons that one can understand, but that seems somewhat wishful, okay? Um, and they voted much, um, much more strongly to stay inside. They were a big remain area, okay? And um, Nicholas Sturgeon, who's now the, um, uh, the leader, okay, has demanded a second Scottish referendum, okay? So with some probability that will be held, okay, because um, that has to be approved by the government in Westminster, but with high probability, they will probably approve it, and with some probability, the Scots will vote to leave this time, okay? You, you just can't discount that, okay? And that's gonna be an issue. The bigger problem is probably with the Irish, okay? So the Northern Irish, okay, um, are relatively, Full and calm at this point. And part of it is because of the Good Friday Accord, which was negotiated under Tony Blair and brought peace to the region. Okay. And a big part of that was a completely open border with Ireland to the south. Okay. Well, if the UK is not part of the Eurozone or, or the European Union, but Ireland remains in, you really, in some sense, have to have a hard border there. And that could lead to civil conflict again in Northern Ireland. And no one really knows what's going to happen about that. Okay, so you could imagine the Northern Irish deciding to become part of Ireland. It's hard to imagine, but it's not impossible. You could imagine a return to um, a fortified border, which would then mean lots of violence. You could imagine them exiting. Okay, so you could imagine both Scotland and Northern Ireland leaving the United Kingdom, okay, which would leave Wales. So it's not just England, it would be England and Wales, but who knows. OK, um, so there are lots of problems within the UK as a result of Brexit. OK, um, and these are just the, the big issue that, that, that I want to um, talk with you about. And then I'll dive into the economics. Um, there are big problems for the European Union. The UK was always a very important part of the European Union while it was in, because it was, in some sense, the offset to the French. Okay, so the French, you know, have these wild political ideas. Okay, so I don't know for for those of you who followed the French uh, the first round of the French presidential election, which was just last weekend. Okay, you got this super hard lefty. Okay, who wanted France? Okay, to leave the European Union and join an alliance with Venezuela and Cuba. Okay, <laughs> and he got he got twenty percent of the vote. Right. Okay. And they've always had this wacko part, and it, that there are a lot of, the, of, of people who believe that. Okay, so France was always their influence was offset by the UK, and that was really useful. Okay, um, and now all of a sudden Germany looks huge. Okay, and without a credible alternative, and that that's going to be become um, an issue. And there's a non-trivial chance that the European Union, absent the UK, will become much more inward-looking and also much more socialist. Okay, um, it's also a problem for places like the United States. Okay, the UK is not a particularly useful country for us, except a, a, as a springway into the European Union. Okay, but more generally, Brexit was the first sign of populism and nationalism. That was the first one, which, and then of course, Donald Trump. Uh, um, won the presidency, and who knows what will happen in France next, um, next week. Um, but really, in some sense, this ultranationalism, it didn't really originate in the UK, but it was the first really visible manifestation. Um, there are other manifestations of it in Europe. So for those of you who don't know much about the current uh, political scene in Poland, okay, there are two parties in Poland. There's the extreme right, and there's the even more extreme right. <laughs> and, and the same thing is true in Hungary to, to, to some extent. So it's not the first manifestation, but it's the first really mainstream, large one that's really worrying. Okay. Um, nobody has said anything, so feel free to, to interrupt, especially if you have a good word, because I realize I'm, I'm giving the doom and gloom thing, but I should say I really actually do believe what I'm saying. So feel free. Oh, oh please. Oh, but it's much further. I mean, don't forget, the, the United States 
has a political spectrum that is much further to the right than any other civilized country in, in, in the world. Okay, so Bernie Sanders, I, I bet, would probably be pretty comfortable in the conservative party. Well, maybe that's an, an, an overstatement, but, but he wouldn't be that far off. So, so when Jeremy Corbyn, who's the leader of the Labor Party, he's much further to the left than, for instance, Sanders would be. Much further to the left. Yep. I was going to say, you had uh, reasons for skepticism. Talks a lot about Gonna come to migration, it. I think. The, oh. you know, the millions of, of Eastern Europeans, I think that's probably a bigger issue. Oh, I'm going to come to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I haven't really talked about anything that, that's economic in nature yet at all. I'm just talking about the, the consequences at this point at a broad br brush level. But you're absolutely right. Yeah. Can I just put in a brief reminder for everyone to use their desk microphones? Because this is being recorded, and we won't pick up questions unless you use Thank desk you. microphones. Did you want to? Yeah. I guess you Leaving Brexit, I mean, the perception uh, of lost jobs, the per, you know, what? I'm going to come I mean, to that. I think it, yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Completely legitimate, but let, let me go on to that. Okay. Um, uh, I'll just say in brief, one of the key reasons why people voted in favor of Brexit was to restore sovereignty. Okay, so that, that all of a sudden, British laws will be um, dictated by British interests, and we are not going to be doing things that those damn foreigners in Brussels force upon us, and, and so we restore sovereignty. Okay. And it is true okay, that the supremacy of European Union law, that violates the, the, uh, a principle that I grew up with as a Canadian, as a Brit, which is Parliament is sovereign. Parliament is in charge of everything. There is nothing superior. So that is true. Okay. But just to make sure that you're aware, European Union laws, okay, are not imposed by this faceless, mindless British bureauc um, bure Brussels bureaucracy. Okay, so the way it works in the, in, in the European Union is that the Commission, the executive in some sense, that's in, in, in um, Brussels, they propose legislation. But it has to be adopted by what's called the Council of Ministers, who are the heads of government for the European Union um, members. Okay, so it includes the British Prime Minister, also the French President, the Italian Prime Minister, the German Chancellor, blah blah blah, and the elected European Parliament. Okay, so it's not like it comes from a bureaucracy without any ch political checks and balances. Those political checks are there in a big way. Also, as we know. The British Parliament is sovereign because it can decide to withdraw from the European Union as it has. Okay. Also, let me just get, get through this. Any time you make any international obligation, you lose sovereignty. So the United States is a member of NATO. And I believe that's what Donald Trump thinks today, but I, one never knows. He's been of different minds. Um, which means that if there's an attack, hypothetically, by Russia on a, a, a NATO member, <laughs> hypothetically Estonia, we are obligated to go to war. Okay, we go to, we, we defend our, our, our alliance partners because we have made that international commitment. We think that we're better off for it and the world is better off for it, but we have lost sovereignty as a result. That's what happens. You make an international obligations, you lose sovereignty, but you gain influence. That's the reason why you do this, okay? And also, just as a, a parting note, um, as a member of the EU, the UK is often represented twice. So for instance, at G20 summits, okay? The UK goes as itself. It's also a member of the European Union, which is, has a separate voice, okay? But of course, their influence is limited within the European Union. Okay, you had a point? Yeah. Uh, to what extent are... Uh, majority, two-thirds, or um, veto powers on part of individual ministers? What's, it depends on the issue, okay? Um, but for anything that's of real um, substantive care, um, of concern rather, to the UK, they essentially have veto power okay. for an anything. But you know, there's a whole gamut of things where you need a qualified majority. But it used to be that they always operated through consensus, and now on anything that's of really serious importance, they would always operate by consensus. Okay. Okay. Um, so I've, I've talked about this, this briefly. I, I think the reason why Brexit is to be regretted by 
any international citizens of the world of whom the, you know, the vast majority of Haas students would, would, would be counted, okay, the Brexit vote was the first real vote towards populism and, and nationalism. The most important role of the European Union is not really to encourage economic development, okay? It's to keep the peace, okay? So no Frenchman has killed a, a, a German or vice versa in an act of war since 1945. And that's a really good thing, okay? So <laughs> I hope I'm, that's a consensual view. Um, <clears throat> um, when, the Euro, when, when you have an exit from it, something that's essentially designed to keep the peace, that's a bad precedent, okay? And it also is gonna make the, it more difficult for other countries to join, and the European Union is gonna be less attractive in the future to um, potential members. So for instance, there are lots of problematic countries in Europe still. So like Serbia has been difficult for well over 100 years. I mean, they're in some sense one of the reasons why the First World War started up. The way to get those countries into shape and quiescent is, is to say, if you develop your institutions and become peaceful democracies that respect minority rights, blah, 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 you can get into the European Union. And that's one of the reasons why the Balkans have been relatively peaceful recently. If you remove that, or the European Union becomes less desirable, there's more warfare, okay? More people die. Because the Turks have no real chance of getting into the European Union. The Turkish government is more repressive. People die, okay? So anything that destroys the European Union or reduces its size or its scope, that's a bad thing as far as I'm concerned, okay? Because it keeps people alive, all right. Um, Okay, so I've talked about the rise of populism. Let me just go, go on for a, a few more things. Part of the, the, thing, um, um, the campaign about Brexit that was regrettable was this view that experts are experts and are irrelevant, okay? Um, and of course, you saw that later in the, uh, the Trump campaign in a big way. And another thing that was, was bad was this view that the Brexiteers said, which is it's way easier to destroy existing institu institutions rather than reform them, okay? Um, another thing that came out in a, in a very big way was people could be in their own media silo, okay? That this was one of the very first um, times where it became very apparent that if you were um, a Facebook Brexiteer, you never heard the other side. Okay, and that was a, that was a big deal. Um, for me also, personally, it shows the downside of referenda. I, I'm not a believer in referenda, I'm a believer in representative democracies because you want experts to be making the decision. You vote for those experts called members of parliament or congressional representatives or whatever, but I'm not a believer in referenda. Okay, so let's go on to the economic consequences of Brexit. Okay, um, okay there are five. Okay, and they're listed in approximate order of importance, okay? Um, but not necessarily in terms of political importance, trade important, uh, um, economic importance here. Okay, so trade is the most important one. Um, and especially, in some sense, it's a part of um, trade, but foreign direct investment, especially in financial services, which is vitally important to the United Kingdom, okay? So that's gonna be disrupted by Brexit. The all important political me um, issue was migration, which obviously has very strong economic consequences. Okay, then there's a regulatory um, issue, and there are some fiscal issues associated with budgetary claims um, and transfers to and from the United Kingdom and the European Union. So I'll, I'll go through the, these at, at least briefly. So the most obvious economic consequence was for British trade. So the question you have to ask is how important is the European Union to the United Kingdom? Okay, and vice versa, of course. So there was this line of argument, which I never understood, which was that the UK runs a trade deficit. It imports more than it exports. So we are more important to them than they are to us, okay? And I never understood it, I should say, in exactly the same way that Donald Trump says, anytime we run a trade deficit, we get screwed which I don't understand because people are giving you goods and you're giving them pieces of paper in return. And it seems like a good deal, uh, but <laughs> nevertheless, let, I, I, wanna I wanna deal with this. It, 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 trade, the, the obsession with trade deficits is a, 
it's, it's something that's been around for a, a year or two, and I've, I, it's unintelligible as far as I'm concerned. Um, the UK is a very open economy, a very open economy, okay? So the usual way that people like me measure it is we, we take a look at the export to GDP ratio, which is around 30%, okay? Um, it is the 11th largest exporter of goods and services in the world, okay? Um, by way of comparison with that um, 28%, we, the United States, are at 13%. Now, Germany is the huge export machine in the world you know, sine qua non, and they're at almost 50%. For a large economy, that's really unprecedented. But the UK is big, okay? Imports are almost the same thing. They're the sixth largest global importer of stuff, and as I've said before, um, they run a current account deficit. Now, many of you are my former students, okay? And one of the things that I always did in class, okay, was said, remember rules of thumb. And the rule of thumb here is, if you are either exporting more than you import or import more than you export and it's small, that's okay. What's small? The number was three, three percentage points. And the UK is outside that zone, okay? So they're vulnerable because they import more than they export, which means they have to sell more financial assets to the rest of the world than they buy. They have to export capital to pay for them. That makes them dependent on capital, like many emerging markets are. That makes them vulnerable, and that's going to be an important thing of, in what, what follows. Okay. Um, the European Union matters a lot for British trade. Half of British imports come from the um, European Union, and half of British exports go there. So we don't care about the deficit or anything like that. We care about the fact that half of their stuff comes uh, from, the, from Europe. And if that was cut off, that would be a serious disruption to consumers and businesses. And half of the stuff they sell to the rest of the world goes straight to Europe. They're the big customers, by, by far the British customers. So the Europeans are really important to the Brits. But the Brits aren't that important to the Europeans. Okay? Only about a tenth of European stuff goes to the UK. So there's this big asymmetry. Okay, so Britain has a lot to lose. Europe, it's not like a tenth is unimportant, but it's much less important. Okay, so in order to facilitate that trade, the UK needs a new trade deal with the European Union. Okay, and they just triggered that. Okay, so Article 50, which is the formal exit mechanism that was triggered relatively recently, which means that the two-year deadline is out and counting. And what they're trying to do is renegotiate the commercial relations between the UK and the rest of the European Union in tons of stuff in two years. Okay, now, trade negotiations are incredibly difficult, okay? Um, the UK has to agree with each of the other 27 members, because each of the other 27, 27 members of the European Union has a veto, okay? Just no reason why you would have paid any attention to this. Um, Canada negotiated a free trade deal with the European Union that in some sense was signed in the fall of this past year, just a few months ago. A tiny little area, a small area of Belgium which is not the biggest country in the European Union, almost vetoed that. Okay, this wasn't a country, not, certainly not a major country, this was a, the equivalent of a township. So the UK has to do the same thing with 27 other countries. So it's not just the 27 countries that have veto power, it's the uh, other political constituencies. And the European Union wants to punish the UK so as to deter future exiters. So these negotiations are not going to be easy. And don't forget, the UK it, um, is much less important to the European Union than vice versa. Okay. Um, most of these trade barriers, oh, did you have a question? Or make a point? I think you have to hold it down while you're speaking. What happens after two years if they don't? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, so in principle, so I, I'll, I was going to come to this later, but let me do it now. Um, in principle, after two years, it, that two-year deadline can be extended if you get unanimity. But you have to get unanimity, okay? Um, after that, we don't really know. Okay. Um, Okay, another thing. What are they arguing about? What are they negotiating about? Okay, they're not arguing primarily 
tariffs, which are international taxes on exports and imports. That's relatively straightforward. They're negotiating about um, non-tariff barriers and rules of origin and all this nebula, uh, ne um, nebulous stuff. So for instance, um, let me give you a quintessential example. Right now, if you're a dentist in the UK, you can serve Italians. If you're a dentist, you can move to Italy and your, uh, your uh, qualifications are recognized. Okay? Um, that's the sort of thing. It's a non-tariff barrier to the trade of services in, in this case. Okay? Um, every single non-tariff barrier is there to, uh, to protect a political constituency. Every single one. So the dentists in Italy don't want the British dentists to be able to come in, or the French or anyone else, because they want to protect their monopoly rights. Okay? Every single one of those is a special interest, and therefore they're difficult to um, negotiate away. So any free trade area that the UK is going to uh, negotiate takes a long time. They have two years to be extended only with unanimity. Okay? And here's the other thing. As of the time that they voted for Brexit, the UK had literally, not figuratively, zero civil servants with experience. Because they didn't have a department of international trade because the European Union did it all. In fact, they haven't had a civil service with expertise in this area for two generations. Because it's done at the European level. They're not supposed to. Okay? So they have no expertise. They've been hiring people like crazy. Okay, but they're hiring either people with very little experience, okay, or they're hiring foreigners, which is sort of weird if you think about it, but, but there it is, right? Um, okay, so the expression is uh, um, free trade agreements do not come free. They don't cover most trade, they don't cover all trade, and they take ages to agree, okay? Another expression that's popular in this business is they're started by liberals, but they're always finished by protectionists. Because one of the, the things that always happens is um, as soon as the details of a plan okay, are, uh, are announced, the lobbyists figure out who's going to gain and lose, and that's when they go to work. Okay, so for those of you who wondered, okay, uh, I'll do something which I do very rarely, which is I will give the Trump White House a, a positive spin. Okay, so for those of you who followed the, ta the announcement of the tax plan on Wednesday, you noticed that it was incredibly bare bones, just a series of bullet points with no detail. Okay, now in almost all likelihood that was incompetence and, and trying to make sure that they did something. <laughs> it was probably done just to make sure that they got something on, on the table by 100 days. But in principle, it's a good political tactic because the more detail that you provide, okay, the more the lobbyists go to work to dilute or change things around. And that's one of the reasons why you often don't get much detail until the final version is released, at which point the, it's too late for the lobbyists. Okay. So the lobbyists here are a big, big deal. So again, just to remind you, the, uh, the Canadian free trade agreement with the European Union began, uh, began in 2007. It took nine years. And Canadians are not the type that try and exploit the Europeans, right? So it's, or, or anyone else, right? So, OK. All right. So the UK needs this deal with the European Union because that's half of its trade. OK. But they also need to deal with the rest of the world because that's the other half of its trade. Okay, and again, they have no expertise. They haven't done anything for, for, for um, 40 years. Okay, um, it is much easier to do that within the European Union to negotiate that, that trade because the EU has a, an entire um, bureaucracy set up for it. The European Union currently has free trade agreements with 53 other countries. For instance, the one they just negotiated with Canada, Korea, Mexico, blah, blah, blah. All of those, all of those 53 deals have to be renegotiated by the Brits single-handedly at the same time as they're dealing with the big one with Europe. Okay. They will probably wait, but that means that their relations with the United States, with Canada, with Korea, with Mexico, with everyone else, that's going to be a mess. Okay. Even if they want to get out of stuff altogether okay, and just say, we're going to be a member of the World Trade Organization, like, for instance, Singapore is. They're often compared to Singapore. That has to be agreed on with 163 other members of the, of the WTO. 
Okay, and WTO negotiations take forever. So you probably haven't heard of it, at least in the, in the last five years. There's something called the Doha Round that was started in 2001, which is still ongoing. Okay, so, the, so trade negotiations take a long time. Why does that matter? Open countries are rich countries. Okay, anyone who says anything to the opposite is just a fool, okay? And if you have any doubt about it, think about the following. Think about countries that are closed off. Are they rich? Well, there are countries like, for instance, North Korea or <laughs> Cuba, right? Or, you know, so like, you know, r uh, open economies are systematically richer. It's been, it's been shown in many, many different statistical analyses, okay? But it should just be blindingly obvious, okay? Um, so exiting from the European Union will probably make the UK more closed eventually, um, and that makes them poor. So there's been a, a big study by the London School of Economics, and um, the, the realistic estimate, the, the best estimate that they could come up with was it leads to a 2.6% drop in GDP per capita in the UK, which isn't the end of the world, but that's more than typical growth in a year. You, you don't want to sneeze at it. Um, in the long run, it could have a much bigger effect on the order of six to 10 percent, okay? Which, again, is not the end of the world, but most of us would not care for a six to 10 percent cut in our, our paychecks, okay? Um, but there's lots of uncertainty because we don't know what they're gonna do when they leave the uh, European Union. We don't know what Brexit entails, okay? So, a few other things to remember. The UK historically has been incredibly open the modern era of free trade was a British idea. It was a British idea intellectually and politically and militarily. The reason why the Royal Navy was a big deal was it kept the seas open for free trade. Okay? Um, and it is already, because the UK is currently open, it has few concessions to give and few arguments to, to give. Also, I will say, historically, the, um, the UK has not only been open to goods and services, it's been historically open to people and ideas. So I assume most of you know this, but um, one of the most famous books of the 19th century, Das Kapital by Karl Marx, was, he was a political refuge living in London. Okay, and there, there's this long tradition of, 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 of that. So my personal view is any state, the, the status quo's view is superior to any possible exit. Okay, there's just almost no way that they can do as well as what they currently have by exiting. Okay, it's, it's essentially impossible. Okay, you sometimes, and it's increasingly rare um, to hear that they will maintain access to the European Union's single market, okay? Um, but they won't be a member of the European Union. That is technically possible. So Norway and Switzerland, okay, are not members of the European Union. However, they have access to the single market. The single market is within the European Union. It can't have any legal barriers to the flow of goods, services, people, labor, or capital, okay? Um, you can have access to that, but you have to pay for it, okay? And then when they change the laws, change the regulations, you're not sitting at the table. So Norway and Switzerland just do whatever the Europeans tell them to do. And it's really hard to imagine that happening. Okay. Um, let me just go on. To, um, okay. Nevertheless, I want, to do t I want to take a step back. Free trade agreements aren't that important because most trade barriers have already been eliminated. So, if you want to think of a, a broad brush number for the, what this is going to cost of the UK, think five to 10%, which is not good, okay? But it, it, and it's bigger than a typical recession, but it's not the end of the world. In all likelihood, there will just be a long period of stagnation for the U United Kingdom, which they've endured many times in the past, okay? It's not a good thing, but you know, it is their choice, okay? Um, Okay, so what are they going to do? The usual um, taxonomy is that there are five different options because the, the, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, has committed themselves to a hard exit, their um, hard Brexit. It's essentially impossible for, to imagine them imitating Norway um, and paying for access to the single market. That's really hard to imagine. It's not inconceivable because they could say th their negotiations are going nowhere, we'll do what Norway does. Um, Switzerland has a slightly different deal, but it's essentially impossible. Um, they could imitate Turkey. 
So Turkey has a customs union with the European Union. It's called, think of it as a free trade area. It's hard to imagine them working that out in two years. They don't have the free flow of labor between Turkey and the European Union. Again, it's possible, hard to imagine them working out in two years, but could be. The fourth option is they could just become a member of the WTO, like Singapore, or Canada, or the United States. The problem is that doesn't cover financial services, which is a critical thing, especially to the political power in the UK. So there will be some special sort of British relationship with the European Union in all likelihood, and that's what they're negotiating over now. And we don't know what it's going to look like. Um, and it's probably not going to look particularly good for the UK, for all the reasons I've given. OK. Oh, please. Um, so it's not up there, but any option that there might be some political move to, what would you call it, come back in? Not Brexit, but, you know, rejoin? Yes. Re okay. And, and uh, so, no, I'm, I'm glad you, you, you said that. And, and that is conceivable. It is conceivable that um, they could hit a serious roadblock and say, we're just going to re uh, revoke our, our, our Article 50. Um, so, uh, uh, Tony Blair, who is a very important prime minister, is urging people to, to do exactly that. Okay, the problem is that he's incredibly politically unpopular. Okay, but there are a bunch of people um, who say that. So probably um, um, the, the most recent polls have, in the order of um, the high 40s, um, are in favor of staying within the European Union. The majority is still in favor of, of, of leaving, but if the negotiations go nowhere, and Theresa May has a large majority in Parliament, which almost surely she will, could she just do a complete U-turn and say, we've negotiated, we can't do better than our current status quo, we're revoking this, and we're going to stay within? Yes, that is possible. It's unlikely. But it is possible. Okay, Parliament's a sovereign. So it's possible. I think it's unlikely. You have to hold it down, unfortunately, okay. so that the green light is showing. Okay. So you, you mentioned all these um, issues, but you did mention the, a special relationship with countries like Canada and Australia, where the Queen of England is still head of state. And also you did mention the Commonwealth, the role of Commonwealth. Um, is there leverage over European Union over these, these issues? OK. Um, <clears throat> everyone hear the question? So the, OK. So, um, there's a long way to answer that question, and there's a short way. Um, <clears throat> um, is, is, is the fact that um, the Queen is still the Queen of Canada and the Queen of Australia and they're in members of the Commonwealth, which has over 50 countries, dozens of them tiny little islands in the Caribbean, but they're still there. Um, does that give the UK a possibility for a different relationship? No. <clears throat> They're just too small and too distant. They're, I mean, and, and don't forget, half of their trade currently goes to Europe. Okay, and then once you take account of the United States, China, and Japan, I mean, as a proud Canadian, I got to say, our commercial relations with the UK, however wonderful they are, are just trivial as far as the UK is concerned. When the people are working in the city of London, they're not really working primarily with relations with. South Africa, New Zealand, Canada, Australia. They're, they're just not. It's just not that important. They tried that before in the 30s, and it failed then, and it's going to be even worse now. OK, please. You have to press and, and hold so that the green light hopefully will Oh, I see. There we go. Very good. Yeah. Actually, my question might relate more to the EU itself. Um, uh, it's still set up as prominent an economic institution, even though you alluded to a lot of other uh, benefits it has. But I, I was able to spend a lot of time in Central Europe and Eastern Europe in 2015. And you, what you see emerging in all those countries is this sort of newly discovered rebirth of their national identity that was suppressed for years and years and, and centuries. So what, how do you see the EU? Need, and it's starting to break apart at different edges, not just north, um, the south you mentioned. How do you see the EU evolving? Uh, to maybe even reach beyond the economic uh, systems into more, you know, culturally inclusive uh, and, you know, blocking some of the fights that are. I could say that the Balkans, it takes a bad stone throw. It's going to blow up again. Yeah, I, it's a completely legitimate issue. And it, 
the, the tradition of European integration was that the elites always moved first, and they typically moved on economic grounds, thinking that they would drag the populace with them, and that, that closer economic integration would lead to more cultural and, and political integration and, and affinity. And that worked for a long time, but it hasn't worked in the last decade or, or so. So I'm completely in agreement with you. The European Union has serious, um, um, serious consequences right, uh, right now. But because it is primarily an economic thing, and most people understand that there are big benefits, like, OK, it's an incredibly superficial thing. But the Schengen Agreement says you can go between different members inside the European Union without showing your passport. That's a really superficial thing. It saves you like five minutes at a passport line every three months when you travel. But that's a really important sign to many Europeans that it's, it, 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 it's a good thing. So what do I expect? I expect more federalism and fewer decisions to be made by the, the center, by Brussels. Okay, as a way to make sure that the European Union doesn't acquire this even more of the stigma that it currently has of being this omnipotent, malevolent, you know, bureaucracy, um, it will probably just fade into the background more deliberately until things calm down, and that that would be just fine. But they're just not that important right now because they don't control that much money in Brussels. Yeah. You know, anyway, please. Um, so for this group, five years ago, you talked about the, uh, some of the potential fracturing of the EU. Mm -hmm. And you talked about the reasons that that was likely to occur in some way that were similar, are similar to the reasons here. And then I know the context was mostly Greece and s s the South. Um, but so two questions. One is, since the reasons were similar, uh, why wasn't this more expected? And then two um, would be you talked about the shock being very potentially very large, bigger than the, the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. How is it different in this case so that there isn't you know, okay. a big shock? Okay, so completely legitimate question. So five years ago when I talked, I talked about European monetary union, the single currency, the Eurozone. And Greece is, is a tenuous member now. Okay, it's not clear that they're going to stay in. Cyprus, you know, in some sense, lost it um, a few years ago, and, and that's why there are capital controls in Cyprus. And there are capital controls inside Greece, right? So you, uh, you can't go in and, and withdraw all your euros from a Greek bank, even, even right now. Um, but the UK was never part of the monetary union. Okay, so the, the, the talk five years ago was about breakup of the European monetary union. Okay, and that is still a serious issue. That is a serious threat to the, to the world economy and it, it, it stays there. But the United Kingdom was never a part of it and realistically was never going to be a part of it. In fact, they have a political opt-out. So this was a, 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 a much different thing because it was in some sense one person's decision, David Cameron's decision, made you know, for reasonable political grounds that they never expected to, to show up. They didn't expect him to win the next election. And if it did, they expected Brits to vote their pocketbook, okay? which typically means stay. Okay? So that's the reason why it was unexpected. Um, it, it, it's very different from monetary union because the Greeks shouldn't be using the same currency as the Germans. That's, they're, they're just different things. Um, when thinking about uh, different industries within Britain, are there any groups or industries that should benefit from Brexit? I mean, maybe ones that would benefit from a much weaker pound, but... Yeah, okay. So the answer is yes, there are some. Um, there are relatively few, but like if you stay in the United Kingdom forever, so you never travel abroad, so you don't care about the value of the pound, the, the fact that your pounds are worth less, okay, <laughs> that's cool. And if you're... Export, well, I mean, don't forget, if you're a Brit and the pound becomes worth less in euros, okay, when you go to Europe, you just think things are way more expensive than, the, than they used to be, right? But, so, but it's, an, it's inflationary, right? So, 
or you have weaker purchasing power, if you want. I'll, I'll come yeah. to it, but there's been no sign of inflation. And the Bank of England does a fine job of keeping inflation at basically 2%, plus or minus nothing. Okay, so there's been a, there's, <clears throat> I'll, I have some data on, on this. I'll show you if, if, we, if we get to it. But there's been no effect that way. If you're an exporter and you're hampered by Brussels bureaucracy, then you can gain. So certain agricultural interests, th um, uh, the agricultural lobby almost exclusively in the, in the United Kingdom voted for Brexit, okay? Because their view was the European Union gives us quotas and, and ridiculous stuff and we send, sell almost all of our stuff abroad and that's a good thing. Uh, they have since come to the realization that actually they get lots of subsidies from the, um, the European Union, but what, what can you say? Um, and the areas towards the north of England, um, which used to be involved with heavy industry, but still there are car manufacturing plants there, okay? Their view is, you know, we're, we're selling stuff and we're not selling it inside the UK, so we're exporting most of it. Um, if the pound um, depreciates, which it has, um, we're better off and that's all right, okay? But the problem is car production and anything really involved in manufacturing involves lots of trade of intermediates, primarily with the Europeans, okay? So the Germans produce some intermediates and sell them to the UK and the UK sells intermediates back to France and they're assembled into something. Um, we have these really long supply chains. That's what adding value at each stage is, is, is all about. So I think most people are, are, are surprised um, by how much they're, 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 they're going to, to lose, insofar as they've thought about it. But I'm sure there are some, some groups, but there aren't many. Yep. Uh, I have just a question about the, the labor mobility piece of mm -hmm. this. I wanted your view on how important that was as a determining factor for people voting for Brexit. And Good. what will the impact be on the British UK economy from that lack of mobility coming in. Okay, so let me move, move over to that. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> that was clearly one of the big issues, and it's a very important issue in, in the negotiations because they don't they have to negotiate about what's going to happen. Okay, so to be a member of the European Union, you have to be a member of the single market, and again, the single market guarantees the free flow of goods, services, capital, and labor within the European Union, okay? So that, that's a, a big part, the free flow of people. You don't have to be part of what's called Schengen, which is the passport free zone, okay? And they're not part of Schengen, but they have to be part of the, of, of the UK. Okay, because they're not part of Schengen, they have avoided almost all of the refugee crisis, okay? So let me just make it clear. Suppose that you're a Syrian refugee and you cross from Turkey into Greece and you get into the um, single market undetected, say. You can make your way in various ways to Germany and find a job there with high probability because Germany is doing really well, okay? And you don't have to show a passport. You can find your way to France, as many have. So there are these camps right outside the, the channel tunnels um, because uh, I will say this as a proud Brit, because they don't want to stay in France, they want to get to the UK, right? So, okay, but, okay. don't take this personally if you're French. Um, but to get into the UK, you're not, they're not part of Schengen. They have to show a passport, okay? And there are only a few ways to get into the UK, right? Because you can't drive there, right? So you have, and you can go through the through the channel, and the, there's lots of protection there. But it's an island nation. Otherwise, you have to land in an airport. And because they're not part of Schengen, they have avoided the refugee crisis. So there are a million plus people that that arrived into in, into Germany the year before. Okay, to a first approximation, none of them have arrived in the UK. Okay, so they're, they're by the vast majority of it. Nevertheless, large numbers of people from what used to be known as Eastern Europe and is now known as Central Europe have moved to the UK primarily in, in search of work. Okay, so there are large numbers of those. So net migration into the UK has been a political hot button for over a decade. So David Cameron, when he was first elected, vowed that he was going to reduce net migration below. The, the key number was 100,000, but they never succeeded. It's always been over 300,000. People want to move to the UK. And that has clearly been a source of, 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 uh, of tension. And that antipathy towards foreigners is a major reason for the Brexit vote. There is no doubt about that. It's a big issue. 
okay? And the standard estimates is um, there are approximately 8 million foreigners, non-Brits, um, <clears throat> living inside the UK. Many of them are non-EU. Okay, so some of them are, are EU, a large number, but, but many of them are not. But they're also, just to make sure that you're aware, millions of people, the estimate is about 2 million Brits living in the European Union, which is, of course, also completely um, legit. And many of them, many more Brits living outside the European Union, for instance, the chair of your <coughs> this session and, and, and me, technically. Um, and le let me also say one other thing in passing that, that I skipped over. There's a strong consensus amongst people who've looked at this that immigrants are net fiscal contributors. So you often hear about these political horror stories of people who move to the UK to take advantage of national health service or welfare benefits or whatever, but there's a large literature that has looked at this and there's a very strong consensus that if you look at the economic benefits on net, okay, the UK government gains strongly on net because of migration, okay, because they bring in way more tax revenues. Typically, European Union migrants to the UK are moving there to work, to make money, which means they pay taxes. They're not moving there to live off the, um, uh, the government's dime. So big, big deal, no, no doubt about it. Okay, um, let me, I, I have many more slides, but we can skip over them and we only have a few more minutes left. So let me just open it up at this point, so please. Yeah, getting back to Scotland and Ireland for a moment, um, mm -hmm. I don't believe either of those uh, states have a substantive economic base, but maybe you can help me with that. Therefore, I view them as a bit of a drag on England, but, um, you know, what are their chances of surviving on their own, or will they immediately go to the EU, and how is that going to be received? Okay, so reasonable question. Um, they're tiny. Being tiny these days is not a barrier to being a country because the world is becoming more and more open, so you get all the benefits of globalization if you're a small country. So you may not know this, but over the last 50 years or so, um, the number of countries in the world has approximately quadrupled, and the size of a typical country has gone down, 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 down. Okay, because small countries can make it. So like um, countries like, for instance, if you've been to the Balkans, um, used to be um, that it was Serbia and Montenegro. Montenegro is a tiny little country all, all by itself. And so it, it, it can make it. Um, <clears throat> so long as you're open, that's the key thing. Um, Scotland is, is the one that we know much more about. Scotland will never, ever, ever be admitted into the European Union. It will never happen, okay? And, and I'll tell you the reason why. It's, it's very straightforward, okay? Because of Spain, okay? Because anything that encourages one region of a country to secede and then join the European Union would to the Spain, the Spaniards say, Catalonia should be allowed to secede from Spain and join the European Union. They will never let it happen. It will not happen. Okay, so the Scots might have these dreams, okay? Although, I gotta say, if you think about it for a second, they're incredibly screwed up because Scotland is much more integrated with England than it is with the European Union. And to say, the Brits are making a mistake by exiting from their closest trading partners, and we therefore will do exactly the same thing at a level <laughs> down. It's just a complete non sequitur, right? But just to answer your point directly, they will never be allowed to join the European Union, okay? Just like if Alabama secedes from the United States, right, it, <clears throat> we will never allow it to join the United Nations or any, anything else. But, and nothing special about Alabama if you're from Alabama, so, yeah. Um, so I want to uh, comment on one point you made before on media. Uh, so all these pains are actually self-inflicted in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. So are we at increasing risk these days because of technology? I mean, we've got Facebook and we got Twitter, even Amazon, right? Everybody recommend everything that you want. So yeah. this is like a self-sustained prophecy. Yeah. Um, yeah, my view is this is a very serious issue and, and something that 
that we have never figured, we have not yet figured out. Um, and it's a 21st century issue. And um, I'm not sure, I, I, I was looking for a, a slide on it, but I'm not sure I have it. But yeah, that's a serious issue for any democracy going forward, that people are just not exposed to a, a large enough cross-section of ideas as they should be in order to make a sensible vote, to hear a sensible debate. And that's a serious issue. It's not specific to the, the UK or to the United States. It's a generic thing, absolutely. Yeah, please. Um, speaking of decisions, uh, given the experience that we've seen, the world has seen with the Brexit so far, do you think that provides any level of encouragement or discouragement to a Frexit, especially given the French election upcoming? Well, I guess my view would be if, um, if Le Pen wins, there will almost surely be a referendum and she will do probably pretty well because the set of circumstances under which she wins which is not a very high probability, but if she wins, that indicates that the conditions are ripe for something like that. So conditional on her winning, which is a low probability, yes, I think Frexit is a serious issue. And I, incidentally, the first week of the second round did not go particularly well for Macron, and so it's an, inc an issue of increasing importance. So, so do you think if there is a Frexit, is that the end of the EU? Yes. Yeah, if, if France leaves, that, that's, that's it, right? Especially because you get this ultimate irony that the European Union was meant to rein in Germany, and Germany would be running everything with France, France out. So <laughs> it, it, that would be the, in some sense, the end. Please. Um, right, next, sorry. One here. Um, so actually, it's quite interesting discussion because, um, quick caveat, I actually live in London and I work for a very large news organization. Um, and so obviously Brexit's massive. We publish you know, the latest in-depth Brexit analysis on a daily basis. So quick plug, our international brand is Times of London, if you guys want to actually see more analysis. But my question to you would be like, I mean, we talk a lot about you know, the UK's wrong decision and I was a Remainer as well. But the thing that I find really frustrating is that, I mean, two reasons we left. So one was obviously the immigration from Eastern Europe. And the other one was sovereignty. So people had this you know, belief of that we're voting for independence. And that was a big thing to say, I voted for Brexit because I voted for independence. And a lot of that is actually stems from the fact that the EU, I mean, to your point with the Canada trade deal, is the fact that it's taking nine years because some tiny place in Belgium is holding it up. And that was, you know, England's frustration is the EU is very, you know, um, bureaucratic, et cetera. And there are lots, lots and lots of problems with in terms of how it's been set up. But yet no one's actually looking to say, what can we do within the EU's, EU's organization to prevent a further issue as opposed to we're going to punish the UK for what they've done and not necessarily saying, what can we do to make sure that, you know, we're making a stronger EU? Oh, I think there's lots of emphasis on trying to strengthen the European Union as both institutionally and in its manifestations and policies. But let me just go back to the first point you made. So it is true that many people laugh at the European Union because there are so many players with veto power, okay, such as the small area in Wallonia in, 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 in Belgium. That's right. And one of the strongest believers in that is the UK, because it wants a veto over almost anything. Okay? And incidentally, anything to do with financial services, and to the best of my knowledge, Every single citizen in the European Union uses financial services. They want to give a veto over that to a small number of people who are, live in southeast England who work in the city of London. So everyone believes that I should have veto power, but nobody else should. And that's what a democracy does, right? That we sort it out, and it's messy. Um, and everyone also blames the center. To, as, the, as the Brits do, but you know, Americans blame Washington for everything, right? They're, they're not doing anything quickly enough, but then what they do is terrible, so, which are, of course, mutually inconsistent views, right? So, anyway, um, you're in short. One more? Okay, so one more, please. So, oh. Yes. Um, so, a lot of the trends that you talked about in terms of rising nationalism or anti immigration and um, anti-free trade, I th would say, are very similar to what's going on in this country. In this country, I would attribute it actually, the true cause, to in income inequality, that the benefits of free trade are not accruing equally. Is that really the cause of what's going on in Europe? And if so, you know, what would you recommend be done, with it, done about it? And you know, is there a political movement that really is trying to address that? Because it's not happening in this country. Okay. Um 
So I agree with you for the United States. <clears throat> and, um, and just to point out the irony, so globalization, openness to international trade is a good thing for the country, but there are always some constituencies that lose, okay? And they're typically right wing, okay? And they vote right wing and they vote anti-socialism, but the social safety net is what they're missing that would enable them to benefit, right? Because if some people gain a lot, some people lose a little, or there are a small number of people who lose a lot, it's the tax and transfer system that enables you to make sure that everyone gains, but they vote against their own self-interest. That's not nearly as big of an issue in Europe because the socialist nature of the state is just much bigger. So the social safety net is much bigger in the UK than it is, for instance, in the United States. So I think Brexit is not primarily an anti-globalization thing, at least in terms of goods and services. They don't like other people, people from other countries, OK? Uh, well, the, the people who voted to exit did, did that. And then there's some nebulous thing associated with sovereignty, which I think is ridiculous, but I, I can sort of understand it. But I don't think of it as being nearly as important as, for instance, the China shock to the Midwest manufacturing basis of the United States. There was nothing comparable, really, in the UK. Okay. Okay. okay, we are right out of time, but please join me in giving Professor Andy Rose a massive round of applause.